Good morning and welcome. Let's sing a few songs together as we uh, move into our next service. Let's begin with number 489. 489, Jesus, lover of my soul. And I see here that the words are by Charles Wesley, a famous Methodist a poet, writer of many such hymns. And uh, this particular one happened to be a favorite, if not the favorite, of Ellen G. White. Uh, this was very close to her heart. Jesus, lover of my soul. Number 489, let's sing it together. Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly. While the billows near me roll, while the tempest still is high, hide me, O my Savior, hide, till the storm of life is past. Safe into the haven guide, O oh, receive my soul at last. Other refuge have I none, hangs my helpless soul on thee. Leave, oh, leave me not alone, still support and comfort me. All my trust on thee is stayed, all my help from thee I bring. Cover my defenseless head with the shadow of thy wing. Thou, O Christ, art all I want, more than all in thee I find. Raise the fallen, cheer the faint, heal the sick and lead the blind. Just and holy is thy name, I am all unrighteousness, vile and full of sin I am, thou art full of truth and grace. Plenteous grace with thee is found, grace to pardon all my sin, let the healing streams abound, make and keep me pure within. Thou of life the fountain art, freely let me take of thee. Spring thou up within my heart, <coughs> rise to all eternity. Amen. Number 359. <clears throat> 359. Hark, the voice of Jesus calling. You know, once we, once we have a relationship with Jesus, we, we find that he is the lover of my soul and, and all that I, I need, then we hear the voice of Jesus calling, don't we? Up at the uh, upper left of the page, just under the the hymn number 359, you notice a Bible reference, Isaiah 6, verse 8. And that's the one where Isaiah has his vision in the temple and uh, uh, sees the Lord uh, mighty there and, and uh, his glory fills the temple. And he hears a voice saying, who will go for us? And Isaiah says, here am I, send me. And that's what this song is about, isn't it? Hark the voice of Jesus calling, who will go and work today? So let's sing it together. 359. Hark the voice of Jesus calling, who will go and work today? 
fields are white, the harvest waiting, who will bear the sheaves away? Loud and long the master calleth, rich reward he offers free. Who will answer gladly saying, here am I, O Lord, send me. If you cannot cross the ocean and the heathen lands explore, you can find the heathen nearer, you can help them at your door. If you cannot speak like angels, if you cannot preach like Paul, you can tell the love of Jesus, you can say he died for all. If you cannot be the watchman standing high on Zion's wall, pointing out the path to heaven, offering life and peace to all. With your prayers and with your bounties, you can do what heaven demands. You can be like faithful Aaron, holding up the prophet's hands. While the souls of men are dying and the master calls for you, come and hear you idly saying, there is nothing I can do. Gladly take the task he gives you, let his work your pleasure be. Answer quickly when he calleth, Here am I, O Lord, send me. Well, that may be all the time we have, but I did want to point out something, just for interest's sake. I can teach you a Hebrew word today. That Hebrew word is hineni. Hineni. Say it with me. Hineni. All right. That word means, here I am. And it's the one that occurs here in Isaiah 6, verse 8. It occurs in the story of Abraham that we read today. Here I am. It's Hineni. Hineni. So there you go. Now you know a Hebrew word. <laughs> Good morning and happy Sabbath. I like beginning my Sabbath with the Hebrew lesson. So I always enjoyed Hebrew. Well, it's a beautiful Sabbath day. We can see the summer coming. And we have the beginnings of crops and fruits on the trees, those flowers and blossoms, reminding us of the purpose for growth, right? The purpose for growth is reproduction. And this is the purpose that God gives all of his children, is that we all should live to reproduce by sharing the love of Jesus with others. So happy Sabbath and welcome to you all this morning. It's a pleasure to be in the house of the Lord on the Sabbath day. Just for a reminder, uh, we will have a fellowship meal following Sabbath services this morning, so we would invite you to join with us. Also, we actually, it's kind of a busy Sabbath afternoon. We have three different things happening. We have the fellowship meal time, which is a wonderful time to, to get to know and get better acquainted with your brothers and sisters in Christ and also share and encourage one another. But also, we have outreach. Our, this is our, our regularly scheduled outreach Sabbath, first Sabbath of the month. And we have beautiful weather and we usually just go out for about an hour at the most into some section of our community just to get to know, to meet and get to know some of our, our uh, neighbors in, in the area, let them know of, of our existence and what things we may have in store for the community in the future. 
and also to meet with them and to talk with them and to learn from them what are the needs in our community and what are things that we can pray for and to be involved with. So it's a good time for the Fair Plains Seventh-day Adventist Church to get acquainted with fellow people in our community. So consider that this afternoon as a, as a valuable thing that we can be doing with some of our afternoon time. Also, this Sabbath, we're having our, our scripture memory activity time for the young people. Uh, normally, this would be a little later in the month, but we, we're kind of, we've made an adjustment for this month. So, scripture memory and activity time for the young people, that's a valuable time for us to help them to hide God's word in their hearts, and that will come back to be a valuable, valuable help for them. Um, I, I know many of you know the name Pastor Dan Tower. He's also a conference evangelist now. But he, told, he tells the story of how when he was just a young boy in his early, early teens, I mean like 12, 13 years old, that general time of his life, his mother challenged him to learn 100 Bible texts. And if I remember right, he chose Bible texts that were like, you know, doctrinal supports, those kinds of Bible texts. And he did it. And he says to this day, those are the texts that his mind goes to immediately because he learned them early in his life. They've stuck hard and fast, and his brain immediately goes back to those texts as they're needed. So it's a wonderful thing to do for our young people to help them establish God's truth in their minds and hearts now when those minds are very elastic and very absorbent. So that's what we're planning and helping helping them to do. So, we do have the Children's Scripture activity time today. If you have young ones, bring them on. And consider this. This is a monthly thing. It's usually third Sabbath of the month, isn't it? Yeah. So, you can, you can put in your head, normally it's third Sabbath of the month. If you have young ones, maybe in your neighborhood, that you have some connection to, Maybe invite those parents and those children, especially on the third Sabbath of the month, so that they can participate too. And grandkids, we love the grandchildren. They're all God's children, and we love to have them. So think about that, and remember third Sabbath of the month. Try to get that locked into your mental calendar. Let's continue our worship time this morning with our hymn of preparation, I Would Draw Nearer to Jesus, hymn number 310. We'll do just the first and last stanzas, number 310.
turn in the back of your hymnals. Our call to worship is listed there. It's number 857. 857. Our call to worship this morning coming from the 95th Psalm, Psalm 95, 6, and 7. What we'll be reading this morning is the King James Version, Psalm 95, 6, and 7. I will read the light print and invite you to join along and read the dark print aloud. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of his hand. hymn of praise is number two. Number two, all creatures of our God and King. Number two. Let's stand as we sing. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice with us and sing. Hallelujah. sun with golden beam and silver moon with softer gleam oh praise him oh praise him alleluia 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 oh rushing wind with breezes soft that ride the winds aloft. Oh, praise him, alleluia. Oh, rising morn in praise rejoice. Oh, lights of evening find a voice. Oh, praise him, oh, praise him, alleluia, alleluia. Masterful and bright, providing us with warmth and light. Oh, praise Him! Oh, praise Him! Alleluia! 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 Let all things their Creator bless. And worship him in humbleness. Oh, praise him, alleluia. Oh, praise the Father, praise the Son, and praise the Spirit three in one. Oh, praise him, oh, praise him, alleluia. Alleluia, Alleluia. Be 
seated, please. So have you been breathing this week? <laughs> I assume you have. I'm seeing eyes open, seeing smiles on faces. I trust you've been breathing. Ellen White says, prayer is the breath of the soul. You think that's true? Do we grow and thrive and live well if we're not spiritually breathing? Not so much. What happens if you stop breathing? Physiologically, if you stop breathing within moments, cell death begins. Did you know which part of your body would you guess? Now I'm, I'm saying other than the brain, which part of your body would you guess is most quickly susceptible to oxygen deprivation? I said beside the brain, your eyes. If a person has been oxygen deprived for a short time, it will show up very quickly in the eyes. Now, what are the eyes a symbol of in scripture and spirituality? Wisdom and discernment, right? So what happens if we deprive our spiritual selves of the oxygen of God's truth and by prayer is that we begin very quickly to lose the ability to discern and to recognize truth and error, safety and danger. We need to breathe. So I'm going to invite you to come with me and let's kneel down and let's breathe together before the throne of God this morning. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, first off this morning, Father, on your blessed Sabbath day, we want to raise before you our praise that you truly are the God that you have told us you are. Unlike the devil's lie at the tree where he told Adam and Eve, he's not really who he says he is. He doesn't love you the way he seems to. We choose to believe based upon the truths and principles of your word and the actions of your hand that we see around about us, we choose today to believe that you are the God that you have told us you are and that your heart is ever drawn to us. And so, Father, this morning on your Sabbath day, we choose to reach our hands, to turn our heads towards you, to, to look upon you and to hear from your word. Father, we raise our praises to you because of your faithfulness, because of your love, because of your care and interest in us, a race of rebels who would kill your very son. Yet you love us. Father, this morning I know that represented in our congregation there will be some who are struggling with troubles and trials in their lives today. Maybe today there is one or more, Father, who are feeling the weight of those troubles keenly and harshly and are beat down and discouraged by the, the circumstances in their life right now. And we pray that your spirit would draw very close to anyone in that situation today and that you would strengthen them by the presence and the touch of your Holy Spirit. We ask, Father, that you would make us ministers to one another by the presence of your Spirit, that you might lead us to give a word of encouragement, that you might guide us to assist and help wherever we can. And, Father, I know there may be others who are challenged with uh, interpersonal issues, whether at home, with spouses, with children, with with people at work, Father, you know those situations, and we pray that you would bring harmony and peace in those relationships, and that you would bend, mend hearts so that we might have peace 
in the home and in the workplace and wherever we are. And Father, you know we desire to do your will as individuals and as a church, and so we ask this morning that you would fill us individually and corporately with your Holy Spirit and equip us to do what you have before us to do for your glory. Change our hearts that we may desire nothing more than to serve the blessed, wonderful God of the universe and our Creator. Now we ask that you would transform us, that you would make us more into the image of our dear Jesus, and that you would use us for your will today and this week. Please be with our pastor this morning as he breaks for us the bread of life from your word, and I pray that your spirit would direct his heart and mind as he presents. And I pray that you would speak through him that which you desire us to hear, to know, to remember. For we pray it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Deuteronomy 8, verse 18, it says, And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that you may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. We, tend, we worship God with our resources because he placed something valuable in our pockets. Sometimes it's hard for us to to not be convinced about these words because you're thinking of how thin your purse is or about the bank account you may not have. Sometimes we search through and still fail to see the value of things we have received. Hence, we are tempted even to doubt the words or comfort by spiritualizing the meaning of the word wealth. A story about a, uh, when a man was asked the difference between him and his wife he answered, When I am hungry, I behave differently from my wife. After my day of working at the office, I drop my bag, rush to the kitchen, and remove the lid from the pot and look for my favorite dish. In contrast, his wife, when she's hungry, she will open the cupboard and the fridge, get the raw materials out, and prepare a delicious meal. Two different strategies to answer the same need. One is seeking desperately for the end product, while the other is using the available raw material. Instead of being frustrated and discouraged about the absence or limitations of the end product, it is more efficient to acknowledge and use God's raw materials. They comprise, among other things, health, energy, talents, gifts He has provided. And God has promised to empower us as we diligently use the raw materials. Do you know one of those most thrilling experiences is to partner with God to produce resources from our substances? Through our participation in tithes and regular offerings, we can praise God for assisting us in transforming the raw materials he has provided at our talents. We thank him so much for his blessings and providing us the resources for the wealth. Would the de- deacons wait upon us at this time?
our Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for showing us the wealth you provided for each one of us. It might not be in monetary value, but you have given us talents that can be used for your glory and resources. Help us to remember what you've done for us that we may do for you, for your glory. May you bless these, the money that it may go to your will. And as I sing, I would like you to think about the parts of your life that you need Christ to make whole again.
Thank you so much for that special music. Did you remember the refrain? Make me whole again. Do not all of us need healing of one kind or another? You know, sin destroys so much, takes things apart, but Jesus brings it all together and can heal. He's the only one, actually. So thank you again so much for this music that reminded us of the love and the healing power of our loving Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, we have something exciting coming up today, and I'm sure you're just waiting to get started. After potluck, we have again our monthly outreach afternoon. That means we only go out for like one hour together, like Elder Jeff just explained a bit earlier. And the weather is perfect today. You know, last time we went out, it was the first week in April, it was like 70 degrees. There was the warmest day within a long time period. And now again, God is granting us a wonderful weather so we can be a blessing to others. So I just want to invite you to consider being a part of being a blessing to others. Actually, last time uh, I went out, there were different teams going out, about three teams going out, and I teamed up with, with Josiah, Josiah Peterson. You know, he's 12 years old. And so we uh, started going. We're, we're now doing across the river, just across the street from Napier, where Lakeland is, in those neighborhoods we're going right now. And then uh, first door we knocked together, nobody opened. Second door, nobody opened. Third door, an elderly la lady came out, and she kind of stayed behind the screen door because she couldn't get it up. It was like a glass screen door. And then she told us to go around the corner to the garage, and then from there enter into her house. And she was so happy to welcome us, total strangers. And she just, come on in. How can it be that a total stranger would, or, or somebody would invite total strangers to just walk right into their house? And then we sat down, and remember, a month ago was just two weeks before Easter, so we had a short survey on Easter and what they associate with Easter and what Jesus Christ and his death on the cross means to them and the relevance for their lives. So we started out the survey, but before that, we kind of, she, I, I don't know how we came to that conclusion or realization, but we realized that she is from Germany. She grew up in North Germany. She's now around 82 years old. And then I tested her German skills, and they were perfect. She was still speaking German without accent. And then we continued conversing in German from there on, which of course for Josiah was kind of challenging to follow the content, but he enjoyed being there anyway. So we continued talking in German, and then I did the survey in German with her. And the first question was, what does Easter mean to you? And she said, I don't know. Then I explained a bit that many Christians at this time of the year think about Jesus' sacrifice on the cross on Calvary. And then I asked her, what does that mean to her life? And then she said, I don't know. Please tell me and the longing in her eyes and the yearning in her soul was unmistakable. She wanted to hear what the death of Jesus really meant. So I started sharing with her what it means. And then uh, she was so happy and it seems like she could not get enough. But then our time ran out, you know, only out for like max one hour. And then uh, after like half an hour there or 25 minutes, uh, I offered her some books, Steps to Christ and others, and she was so happy to receive them. Asking her then, you know, what we can pray for in her life, she said, please pray for my daughter. And do you know what the request was? Please pray for my daughter that she may discover what love is. Can you imagine the depth of longing in that mother's heart? 
it just touched my soul. That was the only door that opened that afternoon that we actually managed to do in that time we were out door to door. And uh, today, there will be hearts and souls again behind those doors, and who knows who they will be. But I'm sure, and I can guarantee you one thing, every knock on their door will be a blessing to them. And I'm sure you want to be a part of being that blessing to them today. So I just want to encourage you and welcome you, or, or encourage you and to um, invite you to be part of outreach this afternoon after potluck. You know, God is so good to us. There are so many blessings He's giving us all the time. And so much to share with others. Like the special music said, the message of healing, that's the message to the world. Before we go into our sermon topic today, let's have a word of prayer together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you again for the blessing and the privilege of being here this morning in this very sanctuary, encountering you on the throne, receiving the blessings from heaven. And Lord, may the blessings today heal our souls. Speak to our hearts and minds, and may we go home strengthened, and may we go home with blessings to share with others. Lord, as we open the scriptures this morning, please put any distractions away from our minds. We know the adversary tries every way possible to distract us at the very moment where you want to speak to us through the scriptures. May you keep those distractions away this morning. And may the Holy Spirit come very near to each one of us. And may my words be cleansed and anointed, and not my own human words, but only the words that the throne of heaven would like to share this morning. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I invite you to open up the Bible with us, and before I reveal the title of today's sermon and the topic, we'll read one verse, and then I will ask you to guess what it might be. The question is, which one of the four? And we're going to read a text now where there are four groups of people mentioned, and you figure out on which one of those four we would like to take time to reflect this morning. Let's go to Acts chapter 1 and verse 14. Acts chapter 1 and verse 14. I should have a slide there, right there. Acts chapter 1 and verse 14. Let's read that together. Do you have your Bibles with you? So let's start. It's a famous verse. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. That's a famous text. Those 10 days of preparation leading up to Pentecost. But there are four groups of people mentioned here. Did you realize that? Which four are they? Number one, it says, these all. Who are they? Those are the disciples mentioned in the verse before. And perhaps also some of those mentioned in verse 15, those 120 that were together. So these all were the disciples, and then in addition to the disciples, we had a second group of people, namely the, the women, their wives, perhaps other ladies. So we had men and women in an unspecified total number, but altogether they appear to be 120, according to verse 15. Then the next one around is who, after the women? Who married the mother of Jesus, and finally, the fourth category of people is the brothers of Jesus. Now, which one of these four would we like to reflect on today? What do you think? What's a good suggestion? Do you have any ideas? What would be fitting on a Sabbath like this? The disciples, the women, the brothers of Jesus, or the mother of Jesus. Well, there are some rumors around that there's a special day coming up tomorrow. We call it 
Mother's Day. So how about reflecting on the one of the four, namely our mothers? Have you known that this is an interesting text from Mother's Day? Have you ever seen this verse 14 in Acts 1 as a text from Mother's Day? It's perhaps a new perspective. So we want to reflect on this together. Just imagine, imagine that groups who have all these men and women mentioned, but there's one family singled out by name. That's the family of Jesus. But even the brothers remain anonymous. There's only one person in this entire verse that is mentioned explicitly by name, and that is Mary. And so let's go on a journey and explore her life in four parts. And we could call it a journey of wisdom because she was a unique woman in a unique situation and um, she needed a lot of wisdom. Just, just, just think about this. Mary got the announcement that she would be uh, bearing a child conceived through the Holy Spirit. Just imagine and dwell a bit on the thought of bearing the Creator within the body of a created being. The Creator of the universe in her womb. Can you, I mean, we men, perhaps it's hard for us to understand what that means for a woman and perhaps even for those ladies who have not born, uh, been bearing a child, but those of you who are mothers, just imagine the thought of bearing the creator of the universe in your womb. What did that do to Mary? Just that realization. Or further down the road, to be nursing the sustainer of the universe It's an incredible thought, how the divine comes close to the human and becomes one. Now, let's start out with the family that Mary was in. She needed wisdom to guide her family. So what do we know about the family after she married Joseph, about that family? What do we know about that family? Well, let's go and read some scriptures together. So let's go to Matthew chapter 13, verse 55. Matthew 13, verse 55. Matthew 13, 55. And this is now like a year or even more into his ministry, but it gives us an indication of part of his family. They will read the following. Is, not, is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. So from this text, what can we infer on the number of brothers that Jesus had? How many? Four. Now, doing some more scripture study and also reading the spirit prophecy, we realize that these were not the children that Mary had together with Joseph, but that Joseph had from an earlier marriage that he was a widow of, his previous wife had passed away, and he brought these four sons with him into the family that he now founded with Mary. So we have these four brothers here. Were there any more persons except beyond those four brothers? that of course now are all older than Jesus because he brought them in from a previous marriage. Well, if we go to another text, Mark 6 and verse 3, we get some more indications on the family of Jesus. Mark 6, chapter 3. And there we read the following. It's reporting on perhaps the same or similar incident. And uh, here it says, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? That's the same thing we just read in Matthew. But there's an additional information here. And what is that? And are not who? His sisters here with us. So in addition to the four brothers, 
Jesus, uh, stepbrothers, Jesus also had stepsisters. Joseph brought all of these kids in. So sisters means a minimum of how many? Two. So four brothers, stepbrothers, and two stepsisters. That's six step siblings at least. Now, when you bring two families together that have different histories, perhaps with a previous marriage, what do you call those kind of families? We call, hmm? Do we call them patchwork families? No? Blended families, okay. So blended families, is it, do blended families face some special challenges? Oh, I heard a resounding yes here. Seems like you've been observing it, you have some experience and seen other families. What are the challenges a blended family faces? You got, you got a family with a history. Let's, let's just take Joseph here. So Joseph has a long history with his children. That means they have a common history. And now basically Mary, as the only outsider, is added to this group of Joseph plus at least six kids, that's seven. So she comes in as the one and now faces seven. And the all, the, all those six have a, all those seven have a common history. And the challenge in a blended family is how the walks can merge. Because everyone has their way of living and their history. So Jesus comes in and uh, uh, Mary comes in and a blended family comes about. And Jesus is born into a blended family. I have a question. Why did God not give Mary a husband that had no previous marriage and no kids? Why not? Why did God intentionally have Jesus being born into a blended family with six at least step siblings? all older than him. Why? Well, you know, blended families can be challenging and, and have a lot of conflict potential. Would you agree to that? Tension potential. So let's read, uh, see how it was in the family of Jesus, if it was any different there. Often we think about the family of Jesus as, wow, it must have been the perfect family. Let's go to John chapter 7 and verse 5. John 7 and verse 5. They will read the following. It's part of a longer story here um, about him and his brothers. But there in verse 5, it kind of brings it right to the point. For even his brothers did not believe him. Now, we are now into the ministry at least one year. So Jesus is how old now? He started his ministry around the age of 30. So he's in his early 30s, and his brothers did not believe him. What indication does that give you of the climate at home in that blended family for the previous 30 years? Was well, that like perfect harmony? Everybody on the same page, totally synced together. Now they were adults, all of them, but back then, in the early years, they were children and uh, younger. So let's um, try to see this from Mary's perspective. So Mary is now being entrusted with the one from heaven to be born through her. And she is in a blended family of nine. Seven with Joseph's side, and then she and Jesus. Nine all together. It's a big family. How do you handle that as a mother? Interestingly, or thankfully, we have, um, we have some nice insights in the book Desire of Ages. There are two chapters that explore very much the childhood and youthhood of Jesus. One is called As a Child, and the other chapter is called Days of Conflict. And they give really interesting insights into the family atmosphere and the family situation that Jesus grew up in. So let's read something about the siblings first here from Desire of Ages, page 87. Uh, 
uh, paragraphs one and two. Being older than Jesus, they, that's now his siblings, specifically brothers, felt that he should be under their dictation. They charged him with thinking himself superior to them and reproved him for setting himself above their teachers and the priests and the rulers of the people. Often they threatened and tried to intimidate him, but he passed on, making the scriptures his guide. So what's the atmosphere at home? There's some things you can pick out here that describe the atmosphere. What are those? Number one, they thought that he should be under their control and they should dictate what his life should be like. Secondly, you can read here, they would often what? Reprove him, now in a kind way or in a humble and Christian and loving way. What do you think? No, it was not a very kind way. So there was an atmosphere of reproof, of dictation. Then there was an atmosphere of threatenings. Jesus was being threatened by his stepbrothers. That's pretty dramatic. Like, if you don't do this, you're going to get in trouble with me. And finally, we see here that they also used intimidation. Now, what kind of atmosphere are we talking about here? Dictation, reproofs, threatenings, intimidation. Would you call this the perfect family? It sounds pretty dramatic and pretty turbulent back in the family of Jesus. Now, staying calm and collected, In spite of these circumstances, it was not easy for Jesus, but through his father's help, he was able to do so. Now imagine now Mary, because we're reflecting on mothers today, so Mary is in this situation where those six kids, at least, that she did not rear initially, are doing this to Jesus, which is her son. What would you feel as a mother? Was that, would that kind of almost tear you apart? and you feel your helplessness and frustration, what does that do to you as a mother? Another one, next page, more insights. The example of Jesus was to them, that's the brothers and perhaps his sisters as well, a continual irritation. He was opposed both at home and abroad. His unselfishness and integrity were commented on with a sneer. His forbearance and kindness were termed cowardice. And we're talking about his child years here now, not about his adult years in the ministry. This is at home. This is the home atmosphere of the blended family. So they were sneering at him. They were calling him coward and there was opposition and irritation. If I would ask you, would you like to be adopted into this family? Yes or no? You might say, perhaps rather not. Sounds pretty turbulent. We probably would want to stay clear of that family. Wow, six step siblings like that? No, thank you. Why did God put Jesus into a blended family? and expose him to all of this. Even here, Jesus was to be an example. Because God knew there will be many families throughout history who have a turbulent situation at home, and Jesus could even here be of an example and encouragement to all of us. Now you might wonder, so this was, uh, we're describing the situation, the atmosphere at home, how did now Mary react to that? What were her reactions? Now the Bible doesn't reveal that, but fortunately in the book Desire of Ages we find more insights. So do you think that Mary, when there were tension and those six step siblings at least were again intimidating or threatening or reproving or dictating over Jesus and she witnesses perhaps at the mealtime, perhaps at the evening, before the evening worship, perhaps in, in the morning, throughout the day when they were taking a walk, whatever the circumstance may have been, what do you think she did? Would she intervene on behalf of Jesus or on behalf of the brothers and the sisters? Or would she just stay out of it? What do you think she would do? What would you do? 
Well, let's find out. Mary often remonstrated with Jesus. What does the word remonstrate mean? How would you give it another meaning? Remonstrate means what? Pardon? Scold. So there's a criticism here. So Mary would often criticize Jesus and urged him to conform to the usages of the rabbis. When the priests and teachers required Mary's aid in controlling Jesus, she was greatly troubled. But peace came to her heart as he presented the statements of scripture upholding his practices. So she would often fall into that temptation to criticize Jesus because of that, all that criticism taking place at home was a heavy pressure on her mother's heart. Mary needed a lot of wisdom to handle this very challenging situation day by day and week by week and even year by year. Actually, the step-siblings kind of leagued together to even try to use Mary as a tool for their purposes. Like six against one, right? They knew each other how they would work, and she was the newcomer into the blended family. As we see here described in this passage right here on page 90, she looked upon the associations of the home and the mother's tender watch care over her children as of vital importance in the formation of character. The sons and daughters of Joseph knew this, and by appealing to her anxiety, they tried to correct the practices of Jesus according to their standard. So there was, a, there was manipulation going on in this home as well. They were trying to sneak in and kind of get Mary on their side as they thought would be the right thing to do to have her on board with them. So Terry, Mary, can you imagine, was torn and, and there was a tension between Jesus on the one hand and those stepchildren on the other. That tension must have been very challenging for her. Have you ever felt that tension in your family? Being drawn in one direction or the other between the members of the family, trying to get you on their side and share their viewpoints and then use you as an argument against the others? Mom said, do 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 Or did you hear that? Dad said that. Or your brother said this. This was happening in this home. Jesus did not grow up in the easiest of homes. There was a lot of challenge. Imagine Jesus in all of that. How would you respond? Would he go to mom and complain about his step-siblings or lash out or what was his reaction to all of this? Even when Mary remonstrated him and criticized him uh, unjustifiedly, how would he treat his mother then? when he knew it was not fair what she was doing to him in her limited understanding. She loved him and she, 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 she trusted the Lord's promise that he is the Messiah, but she did not quite understand the full picture. And so Mary was often torn back and forth between those opinions in the family. But Jesus, in spite of all this treatment from his brothers, this is very encouraging, Jesus loved his brothers and treated them with unfailing kindness. But they were jealous of him and manifested the most unbelief and contempt. How are your siblings treating you? And how are you treating them back? Jesus was very unfairly treated at home. But he treated them all back with respect did not mean he agreed with them or did what they told him or expected from him, but he was respectful in all what he did with dignity and with courtesy, but with decisiveness and love, firm but loving. But how about his mother? Well, towards his mother, he also showed respect. The life of Christ was marked with respect and love for his mother. Mary believed in her heart that the holy child born of her was the long-promised Messiah. 
throughout his life on earth, she was a partaker in his sufferings. She witnessed with sorrow the trials brought upon him in his adult years. No, childhood and youth. Where were those years spent? At home. She witnessed with sorrow the trials brought upon him in his own home through his step-siblings. That's basically how you could translate that right there. It was hard for Mary to be a mother in that blended family. And you know what touched me was, it says here, throughout his life on earth, she was a partaker in his sufferings. And I have a question. Can a mother ever forget her child? Whatever that child may be going through, even if it is rebelling and turning its back against the parents, would a mother's heart forget it? You know, being a mother, you will always carry that life situation of your children. You will be a partaker of it in your heart and soul. In the joys, but also in the sorrows. A mother cannot do otherwise very hard to do otherwise. Children remain close to mother's hearts. But maybe this picture illustrates some of the days that Mary experienced. Praying to the Father in heaven. Perhaps feeling at being at the end of her resources and strength. Perhaps crying in her heart again seeing the treatment of Jesus by the step-siblings, or perhaps again realizing that she unfairly took side with the step-siblings against Jesus, or as she again witnessed Jesus being wounded in his heart. I think Mary cried a lot in prayer. What do you think? It would be great to hear her talk here, to hear herself as an eyewitness story. That would be really fascinating how she would share that with us. Maybe you're a mother, and maybe this picture illustrates what you sometimes feel in your family. Maybe you go into your closet, into the bedroom, on the porch, in the car, during the walk, and you feel just like this picture says, Lord, help me. I don't know what to do next. Please intervene through your spirit. But it doesn't only have to be mothers. It could be grandmothers as well. You know, grandmother, you're also a mother. Yeah, and grandmothers, they can never forget their children or their grandchildren. It's the same. If I ask you grandmothers here, could you ever forget your children or grandchildren? I think you would all say, never. They're in my heart every day. Grandmothers praying, you know, it's powerful. We know the story about Timothy and his grandmother, right? And Paul mentions that he was a, she was a blessing in his life. So, there's a gift for you when you exit the door today, gift number one of three. The first gift will be a card that has the following uh, words from the book Adventist Home. It is impossible to estimate the power of a praying mother's influence. She acknowledges God in all her ways. She takes her children before the throne of grace and presents them to Jesus, pleading for his blessing upon them. The influence of those prayers is to those children as a wellspring of life. What an encouragement. See, those prayers of mothers make a difference. Those prayers of grandmothers make a difference. So mothers, you're free to pick up this card at the end of the service. Um, if there's still cards left over after the mothers have picked their cards, then, and the men who are here, but the mothers perhaps are present and you want to bring it home to your wife, or to your grandmother, or to your parents, whatever, uh, 
Then after that, then the ladies can take the cards if there are any remaining over, the single ladies or unmarried ladies. But you can bring it home to your mothers if you want to. So this is a card for you all this afternoon. Maybe we have enough for all of you. That would be nice. Now, first we talked about the family of Jesus. Now let's talk about the wisdom that Mary needed to guide her son, Jesus Christ. And we can start out in Luke chapter 1 and verse 54. Luke 1, 54. Luke kind of gives uh, most insight or a lot of insight, more than some other Gospels, into the beginnings of Jesus on this earth. Luke chapter 1 and verse 54. And this is in the Song of Mary. In the Song of Mary that she sang after the angel announced to her that she would bear the savior of the world, the Messiah. So Luke chapter one, verse 54 and 55, and, it, and it, it gives an insight into the thinking of Mary, into the world that she was living in. And what world was that? It says there in verse 54 and 55, he, that's now the Lord, has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. So what, this, what does this reveal about the mindset, the perspective that Mary was thinking in? What do you discover right there in that verse? She was aware of what? She was aware of the history of God's dealings with man, and specifically with God's people throughout history which means that she was well versed in the word of God. Sometimes we believe that Mary was a very simple woman and unknowing, she might have, she had a simple life, but that did not mean that she was ignorant. You know, God would not pick for the mother of his son on earth, somebody who would be ignorant of the word of God. She was deep into the scriptures. And actually, in, among the Israelites, it was um, the mothers were the teachers in the home and they had to be very knowledgeable in the history of God's dealing with man and the plan of salvation. Actually we read here in the, the Zara of Ages commenting a bit on this uh, phase of her life and Jesus as a child. From the earliest times the faithful in Israel had given much care to the education of the youth. The Lord had directed that even from babyhood the children should be taught of his goodness and his greatness especially as revealed in his law and shown in the history of Israel. Song and prayer and lessons from the scriptures were to be adapted to the opening mind. So training the young in the history of God's dealings with mankind in the scriptures was foundational. And every mother did that. Training the mind the spiritual mind was a huge component in being a mother in the times of Israel. Actually, we, we read even more here, more specifically, fathers and mothers were, in, were to instruct their children that the law of God is an expression of his character and that as they received the principles of the law into the heart, the image of God was traced on mind and soul. Much of the teaching was oral, but the youth also learned to read the Hebrew writings and the parchment rolls of the Old Testament scriptures were open to their study. Just imagine here. So, they read, they learn. So, so who taught Jesus to read? His mother. So she was literate. Who taught Jesus about the Old Testament scriptures and the Hebrew writings? It was his mother. She was well versed in the scriptures. She was a solid Bible student. Truly educated by the word of God. And she conveyed what she had learned to her son Jesus Christ. So in her rearing of Jesus Christ, that wisdom from on high that she had received through the scriptures, she could pass on to the young Jesus. Now, continuing a bit here in his growth, we go to chapter 2 and there are verses 14. I was going one chapter forward here in the book of Luke. And the result, the result of this interaction between Mary and Jesus is described in that verse 40. One verse, very short, covering a long time span. 
it says, and the child grew and became what? Strong in spirit and filled with what? Wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. Now where did that wisdom and that strong in spirit eventually go back to? The workings of Mary in his life. And of course, the Holy Spirit as well. Jointly leading him step by step. Mothers, may every child and grandmothers, may every grandchild that God has entrusted to you grow and become strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, with the grace of God upon them. Pray for that to happen. For God to use you as mothers and grandmothers to make that a reality through the help of the Holy Spirit. Verse 42 says, if we go a bit further down now, he's 12 years old. So this verse 40 was up to the age of 12. Now at the age of 12, he says there in verse 42, and when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. And 46 says, now so it was that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. Did Mary have a part in bringing Jesus to this point of insights and maturity? She did. Of course, as he became older, he interacted himself also through the Word of God and in prayer with his Father and grew through that source of strength as well. But Mary had an important part in making Jesus able to both listen and ask those questions at the age of 12. She must have been asking him a lot of questions to challenge his thinking when he was young. You know, his mother was his first human teacher. From her lips and from the scrolls of the prophets that she read with him at the beginning, he learned of heavenly things. The very words which he himself had spoken to Moses for Israel, he was now taught at his mother's knee. Can you just imagine the situation? Jesus rediscovering what he had authored thousands of years before. Just that idea is kind of mind-boggling. Jesus had to discover what he himself, through the Holy Spirit, had authored. Powerful. And so, after that experience, at the age of 12, we have another um, description of him and how his life was growing in verses 51 and 52 of that same chapter in Luke. It says right there, Then he went down to Nazareth, down with them and came to Nazareth. That's now after that encounter, um, uh, after going to Jerusalem, and was subject to them, but his mother kept all these things in her heart. 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom, and stature and in favor with God and men. Ch Jesus' child was so dynamic and so growing. And Mary was a big part of that. Do you think that Jesus sometimes, I mean, Mary sometimes, I mean, there's no re not really a lake near Nazareth, but perhaps she went out somewhere in the nature in the evening at the sundown or perhaps at sunrise and she went out there and did we get the right? Okay, we got the uh, Okay, we can skip that one. And she went out there and she prayed for Jesus. Do you think that happened? The Creator, the Savior is entrusted into your hands. I think Mary spent many hours like this out in nature, talking with the Heavenly Father, heart to heart. And mothers today are encouraged to do the same. Mothers, being 
deep into the scriptures, conveying and sharing what they have discovered of the Savior with your children, praying that God will guide them and make your children increase in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Even grandmothers, your cooperation is so essential for this process. So there's a second card you can pick up uh, this morning with the following quote regarding the power of a mother's prayer. It says the following. The power of a mother's the power of a mother's prayers cannot be too highly estimated. She who kneels beside her son and daughter through the vicissitudes of childhood, through the perils of youth, will never know till the judgment the influence of her prayers upon the life of her children. Have you sometimes felt that, oh Lord, am I making a difference in my child's life? Am I kind of losing control of where they're going and drifting? Every prayer that you speak, dear mother, what does it say? There will be an influence in eternity. Maybe not seen right now. Just imagine how many years Mary was praying for Jesus and the step-siblings. 30 years and they were still giving him a hard time. Apparently nothing changed in their attitude. Even one year or more into his ministry, they did not believe in him. But I'm sure Mary was praying both for Jesus and those four brothers and the stepsisters day by day. Mary must have believed in the power of her prayers. We've been reflecting on Mary and the family situation being blended and the challenges with the tensions. We've been reflecting on Mary rearing up and guiding Jesus, but what about Mary herself, her life and walk with the Lord? Because you, you need to replenish also your own reservoirs in your soul. She needed to grow personally as well. And I think in her praise in the Song of Mary, back in chapter 1, we get a small insight into perhaps a part of an answer to that question. What was it like in her own nourishment of her own soul? Verse 49 and verse 15, chapter 1 of Luke, we read, And his mercy is on the... Uh, for, sorry, 49. For he who is mighty has done great things things for me and holy is his name and his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation where did she find the strength for herself according to these two verses she found the strength in realizing God is the almighty one and he's the merciful one and he will sustain me day by day, from day to day, each day on its own. She had an intimate walk with Jesus, and she knew she, she, uh, with, with the Lord, with the Father, and she, with God, and she knew that she could go back to Him, to the Heavenly Father, and receive the strength that she, she uh, so much needed. And you know, mothers, we may be very busy with our lives, rearing the kids, caring for the family, but it's so important to have that time with the Lord. You need time for yourself. And here, husbands, you can help out. Figure out some way where you can relieve your wife, the mother of your children, to give her that space to resupply and replenish her own soul's needs. As mothers, it can often happen we run to and fro from one thing to the other and, and get caught up in the business and don't know how to manage it all. Husbands, find creative ways of giving your wives that space where they can replenish their souls. Space in time. Or perhaps space in geography, some locations. They need that. Our mothers need that very much. 
Perhaps this statement from Adventist home can be understood in this way. Let the wife and mother take time to read, to keep herself well informed, to be a companion to her husband and to keep in touch with the developing minds of her children. Let her take time to make the dear Savior a daily companion and familiar friend. Let her take time for the study of his words. Help your wife, help the mother of the children you have together to find that space and time. They need it. Our mothers deserve it. The time between themselves and the Lord. Them and the scripture and Jesus. Them and the scripture in prayer to the Father in heaven. Our mothers need that time. Let's help them find it. Even our grandmothers need that time too. And you can support your children and grandchildren in your time with the Lord that you have personally. You know, spending time with Jesus is like receiving a flower. Would you agree to that? Spending time with Jesus is like receiving a flower from him. There's fragrance, there's beauty, there is love. Spending time with Jesus is like receiving a flower from him. And you know, uh, what do you call those leaves in a flower? Petals? Or, so the, the leaves of the flower, the petals, look here, there's so many of them, and a rose just packed together. And every petal in that flower is a, I love you from the Lord. Every single one of them. I'm here for you. I give you the strength you need. I can resupply your soul resources and refresh you as you yearn and desire. Those flowers from heaven are greetings of love for you. And for that reason, we actually brought some flowers today. So next to the two cards, every mother can take a flower with you. They're different colors. You will find it all at the exit door. And then the others of us um, can bring flowers to our mothers that perhaps are not present here today. Give it to our mothers. But first the mothers themselves. And then if there's something left over for the others who have mothers uh, but are not mothers themselves. Every flower is a greeting from Jesus for you. Now, what's interesting is now, so they're spending these 30 plus years in total family tension. The blended family is turbulent at times, very contentious. The stepbrothers and stepsisters of Jesus are aggressive and intimida intimidating and threatening him and reproving him and dictating him and we all read about it. But suddenly, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 14, they're all together now praying. Something must have happened. Some prayers of mothers must have been heard. Some workings of the Holy Spirit must have come across and reached the heart. Going back to that verse 1, uh, verse one and 14 where it started out. Let's go back to that again. This is our closing verse for, tonight, uh, for today this morning. Acts chapter 1 and verse 14 says right there, these all continued with one accord in prayer. So all of them were in one accord. That means even Mary and the brothers were all in one accord. God had done something to transform hearts. So had they been celebrating Mother's Day back then, which they maybe did not do, this must have been perhaps one of the first Mother's Days where mom and the stepchildren were of one accord. And they were praying for one thing. They were praying for one thing. What were they praying for? Together, as a family, unitedly. They were praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They have realized 
Jesus, they're indebted to him. And Lord, fill us with the Spirit so we can share the good news of who this Messiah, the Jesus, actually is, the Savior and the healer of this planet. They were filled with that desire to go out and spread the good news. A united, restored, healed family now together in service and ministry for Jesus Christ. Holding hands, standing there with a common purpose and desire and destiny. Lord, we're, Mary, we're together with you in this. And Mary to, this, to her stepchildren, we are together in this. With all the disciples and all the other women joining in. This must have been an awesome occasion. Finally, the Jesus family is united in the cause of Jesus. Their mothers, their families, their church. May God give us a lot of wisdom and may we pray for our mothers as they rear the children. And may all of this end in that wonderful situation that they experienced back then. United family, praying unitedly for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So actually, those 10 days of prayer is a Mother's Day message. Did you realize that? Perhaps an unusual perspective, but it is. May our homes, our families, be such places where we pray for the outpouring of the Spirit. May the mothers and fathers go ahead and say, kids, we want to pray for this together. So we want to change the closing hymn today. Um, I think when there's love at home, it's a better hymn. 652 and this hymn expresses that family there's the love and there's the unitedness and you're praying for one thing lord pour out your holy spirit and maybe all today as we especially think about our mothers maybe just ask lord please bless our mothers we want to thank them for the ministry and service they have done to us and our grandmothers as well and move forward and say with our mothers with our fathers, the children all together, be they biological children, be they stepchildren, we don't care, all of us together as families in their homes and then as families together at church, pray, Lord, we want the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to share the good news for these times. Do you, win, do you want to be a part of that? I want so, and I'm sure you do as well. So let us stand up together and sing hymn number 652, Love in the Home. 652.
Lord, we just sang, when there's love at home. May the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, work in all of our families, in all of the hearts of the members of our families, that this love that we just sang about may become a reality. And as the family of Jesus, just in those days preceding Pentecost, our Lord, you know, sometimes we live in families where there's tension and contention and, and different challenging situations. Lord, we want to pray for our mothers. Give them a lot of wisdom and heavenly serenity and assurance that Jesus is their best friend, helping them. And he understands because he experienced a lot of this himself. I want to pray for the fathers and the men of the houses that we may support our wives and mothers in a way that they are sustained and refreshed and supported in a way that is a blessing to the whole family. Pray for the grandparents. What a blessing to have them as well. Our grandmothers are so precious. May you bless them as well, Lord. And may their influence upon their children and grandchildren make a difference for eternity. Lord, we heard today that the prayers of a mother go way beyond the present hour and reach into eternity. May every prayer spoken by mother in this room here tonight, this morning be heard in heaven and find its fruit for eternity. Is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen.